Now let's talk about conversions. Conversions are an application of synthetics, but um, just let's provide a little background to it. So let's figure out if it is possible to know the theoretical cost of a synthetic trade. So is, is this something we can know how much should we pay for a synthetic? Um, the answer is very simple. Yes, from the equation you know that a synthetic is just basically the underlying minus the discount factor times the strike. So, so if you know all those things, you can price the natural value of a synthetic of the theoretical value, the fair value of a synthetic. For example, the, let's do a very simple example. Let's assume that the discount factor is 1. So this equation is only underlying minus the strike. And to make matters even easier, let's price a synthetic, a long synthetic, uh, where the strike is exactly at the money. So out of a coincidence, uh, something is trading exactly uh, at the strike that we have. So what will be the cost of a synthetic at the money? The answer is zero. A synthetic at the money should cost nothing in notional terms because uh, the strike K and the underlying are exactly the same level at the at the money level, so that's a really good uh, like guideline. If you're trying to price a synthetic which is happens to be at the money, it should be very close to zero, very close. Like uh, if D is equals one, if the discount factor is equal to one, it will be zero. Of course, I mentioned that the discount factor is not quite one. Sometimes can be 0 0.99, 0 0.98. So this, the synthetic, uh, the, uh, the money synthetic will have some cost. It will cost some money, but uh, not that much. But of course, if you want to be really accurate and you know exactly the interest rates, the dividends, all, all sorts of things, you can know the value of the synthetic. So knowing that, let's look at several scenarios. What happens if the price of the synthetic, when you go there and in your in your broker, in your software, you go and look at the synthetic, what happens if the price of that synthetic is actually higher than the natural price and the theoretical price? Well, you get a free lunch. That is plain as that. The, the, the One of the easiest arbitrages is to find synthetic trades that are priced higher than they should be. And it's a free lunch because you can structure a trade. Look at what trade can you structure? I, I'm going to let you think about it for a second. But well, it's right there in the slide. <laughs> so uh, the answer, is yes, is on the slide. The answer is so. If you have a synthetic that is higher than a theoretical price, the, the only thing you have to do is you buy the shares and sell the synthetic. So. For instance, with options, then you buy 100 shares and sell one synthetic. And then that's it. You are completely covered. There is no risk on the position at all. The total risk is zero. Because you are long the shares and you are short the synthetic, you know? Uh, and because the two of them are exactly the same, then you don't have any risk. However, because the synthetic is uh, higher than the theoretical price, you are pocketing a profit right there up front. So that's the definition of an arbitrage. You are basically trading a synthetic that is substantially more expensive than it should be and you pocket the difference. And this strategy, when you buy shares and you sell a synthetic long, or a synthetic, or, or you go short the synthetic, is what we call a conversion. And this is a, an arbitrage uh, strategy. So you know, you you have listened to me in the Gamma Optimizer room talk about arbit, arb this, arb that. No. So an arbitrage is a trade that is risk-free and it doesn't get more risk-free than this. So I know by now you should be like, man, let's look for all these free launches that should be around in the market. Let's analyze under what circumstances is the synthetic overpriced. First, this is a very infrequent case. The overpri an overprice of the synthetic, synthetic over natural is a very, very uh, rare, it's an infrequent case. It happens, but it's kind of infrequent. How can it happen? So you remember there are, there are two equations. One equation says that the synthetic is just a long call and a short put. And the other equation is normal, it says the synthetic is the underlying minus the discounted strike. So, um, the 
the possible reasons come from the two equations. From this equation, what is the possible reason that the synthetic be overpriced? The only reason is if the call is overpriced. If if calls are overpriced for an underlying, and overpriced means that they are breaking put call parity. That's that's overpriced. Like they are not respecting put call parity. So if for some reason calls are not respecting put call parity, then the synthetic can be overpriced. This is what is very infrequent. This is a situation you don't see normally. Usually calls tend to be a little bit underpriced. <laughs> so um, it's really rare, but it might happen. You might see it. But another reason which is also infrequent but more likely than calls being overpriced is something to do with the discount factor this this could be a good reason for arbitrage the discount factor is something that is variable as you saw on the on the at the very beginning the discount factor is just it's a function of the interest rates and dividends so for instance assume that there are no dividends uh, then the the discount factor is only interest rate dependent if for some reason you get a much better interest rate than any other market participant you could do this conversion arbitrage because the money that you are getting from the from the risk reversal can be invested at a higher rate than other market the market participant that was pricing it and that's why you make some money you, you are kind of doing a rate differential arbitrage there uh, there is not a lot of money to be made but I, some people do it some people have access to either better credit or to more profitable interest on investments so that's kind of the the conversion is 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 an arbitrage it can be done for other reasons other than arbitrages but uh, it is a uh, it is there uh, i am presenting this for you now let's talk about the opposite the opposite of the conversion is called a reversal in this case the question we want to ask ourselves is what happens if the synthetic is cheaper than the theoretical price surprisingly this is very frequent case it's incredibly frequent this is uh, i bet if you go and start scanning uh, normal stocks in particular uh, high beta stocks you will find this so yes if you find a synthetic that is cheaper than it should be we we have another free lunch and it's a free lunch because in this case you do the opposite in this case you buy the synthetic and sell the chairs and you pocket and it's a risk-less profit because the synthetic is cheaper. In fact, and at the money synthetic will give you a credit, <laughs> so you're getting paid to enter this position, and um, and you pocket a risk-less profit up front. And and again, this is a very frequent case. I bet I could identify several stocks where this particular uh, condition is happening. Of course, there is a problem. The problem is that, yes, it's very common, but actually making a profit out of it, it is tough. And it is tough because it's a chicken and egg problem. Uh, a reversal is a very good strategy. You can actually do it. And, and let's examine the reasons why it's a chicken and egg problem for a reversal. Then let's look about when can the synthetic be cheaper than the theoretical price? Again, the two equations are very simple. It's like, okay, the, the definition of a synthetic is a long culture put, and also the synthetic should be uh, equal to the underlying minus the discounted strike. So, so from here, of course, one reason that the synthetic could be cheaper is if puts are really expensive. If puts are breaking put call parity, and this case does happen uh, all the time. Puts tend to be overpriced, and in for under several conditions, and and in sometimes they tend to break put call parity, and also. There is a big difference in the discounted rate, uh, and it usually happens at the same time. And when does that happen? Of course, it happens when an stock becomes hard to borrow. I, I know for some of you that love to short uh, stocks, you have encountered the situation before. You have this like the perfect short ever. You know that this company is going bankrupt. You know that this thing is going to zero, and you are not the only one i mean you and everyone else knows that so everyone is short in the company what happens when there is a massive short interest well what happens is that 
because in our naked shorting is in theory forbidden by law. <laughs> um, and so because naked shorting should not happen, although it happens a lot, of course it happens, but it should not happen, then the chairs, you have to borrow the chairs in order to short it. The problem is the owners of the chairs will demand outrageous interest on it, and therefore the discount factor starts diverging from the market because the interest on borrowing the chairs is gigantic. So right here, then it, it starts to underprice the synthetic. And second, the puts become really expensive because puts are indirect ways of charting. Now puts are indirect ways of charting. But beyond that is because everyone, the first thing that if you cannot access chairs to chart, what will you do? You sell the synthetic. No, that's the easiest way. If if options are hard to borrow and it's impossible and the cost of borrowing is really high, they are charging you 20% per year to borrow the chairs, then the easiest thing is just to do a synthetic position and short it with the synthetic. Let's sell the synthetic. And then, so everyone is selling the synthetic. Uh, millions of millions of people selling the synthetic. Then the synthetic drops in price just because of supply and demand. There is an oversupply of synthetics and, and and uh, the buyers of the synthetic are, are, you know, are not willing to pay full price. And because of that, it becomes really cheap. It is, it is become really cheap. And that's, that's what is so frequent because these hard to borrow situations are very frequent. And in particular with the stocks that, that have massive short interest. Now, now that we understand why, why the reversal is common, we can also understand why it's like a, chicken and egg problem. What is the chicken and egg? Of course, the, the, the chairs are hard to borrow and you notice that the strategy requires you to sell chairs. No? So somehow you have to short a stock that is already hard to borrow in order to buy the synthetic. So that's, that's, a, that's kind of a fulfilling problem because, uh, let's go, sorry about that. Um, in this case, it's a chicken egg problem because, of course, if the chairs are hard to find, then shorting the stock will be very difficult. Not only difficult, but tremendously expensive because you have to pay outrageously high interest if you don't own the chairs. So if you if you are seeing this, like you you are just like a normal observer, you have no vested interest in this company, you have no chairs on the company or anything like that, and suddenly you are seeing that there the synthetic is underpriced and you want to play, you won't be able to play because <laughs> one of the leg is to short and no one can short. I mean, it's hard to find, uh, it's hard to borrow and it's very expensive. So you are out of luck. The only ones that could play this really efficiently are the ones that own the chairs. So if you already own the chairs, then you could do this. You could you could do this transaction. You you could basically sell the chairs you already own, buy the buy the buy the synthetic, and that's it. Um, and and take an arbitrage, a free lunch. But look at this. There is a philosophical problem with that because <laughs> the problem is if you own the chairs, then you're already suffering massive losses. I mean, if all of the all of the short sellers are peeling up into your stock. It means that your stock has been beaten up quite a bit already. So you are sitting on on market to market losses that you are hoping to recover at some point. But if you decide to do this strategy, then you are forced to monetize the loss. You are actually monetizing the loss. It's not market to market anymore. It's not unrealized. It becomes a realized loss. So, so look at what you are exchanging here. You are you are realizing a loss that could be potentially huge. For what? For an arbitrage that is kind of small in the context of the fall. So if you own the chairs, it's like, okay, <laughs> I, I am losing like 20 bucks on the fall, but I'm going to earn a few cents in the arbitrage. It's kind of a sad situation, no? And also, if you, if you get rid of the chairs, then that's it. You're forfeiting whatever potential recovery that can happen once the panic has passed and you're kind of forfeiting that, that thing. However, that being said, if you, if you own shares and you are suffering through the drawdown and, and you think that it can get even worse than it has been, like for, ex for example, you think the company could go bankrupt or, or go close to zero or delisted, you no, know, any of these situations, then yes, doing this 
uh, reversal trade will work really well for you because um, then at least you're already losing the money and at least you can make some money on this trade. So if you look at it that way, then you say, well, okay, not that bad. I mean, it can work. But as I say, for um, many of you, then it won't work. Of course, um, conversions and reversals can also happen under other conditions, and but I won't, I won't enumerate them yet. Probably I will do a video with more like um, grounded data with examples how to how to trade this. But yeah, there, there are also some dividend plays with reversals and and dividend plays with uh, conversions. So now let's move. Let's move into the last advanced position. Again, it's advanced not because it's hard to execute or because it's hard to conceive. It's advanced because it has interesting concepts behind it. Let's look, let's look, look at boxes. A box trade is probably the weirdest trade ever. Uh, on the face of it, you don't even know why will anyone do a box. I mean, why would you do a box? So as we saw the on the risk reversals and conversions, both of them uh, had a long leg and a short leg. For instance, on the reversal, the long leg was done with synthetic and the short leg was done with chairs. And in the conversion, uh, it was the opposite. The long leg was done with chairs and the short leg was done with the synthetic. So conversions and reversals are having long and short legs simultaneously with different instruments. A box, is basically do is being long and short, but with synthetics on both legs. Okay, that that's what a box is. So a box, a box trade is is a trade where you go long a synthetic and then at a certain strike, and then you go short the same synthetic uh, the synthetic at a different strike. But because the synthetics don't, don't it really doesn't matter what strike you pick, they are tracking the underlying, no? So you are basically long and short the underlying, so you are not exposed to the directional risk and and that's the trade, that's a box trade. The question is why would you do that? <laughs> so let's ex let's let's look at what a position like this uh, should cost. No? So you have a synthetic. Remember that a, a synthetic one is the underlying minus the discounted strike one, and the synthetic two is the underlying minus the discounted strike two. Now that's that's kind of the two synthetics that we have. And the cost is like I'm going long synthetic one, I'm going short synthetic two, it really doesn't matter. You notice that uh, S cancels and this can factor is the same. You notice that the cost of the synthetic has nothing to do with the cost of underlying or with Greeks or with anything. The cost of the, of the box trade with synthetics is just the difference between the strikes. That's the cost. Multiply by the discount factor. Remember, if you make the discount factor close to one, then it's easy to visualize. So a box trade is just basically a trade that will cost the difference between the strikes. That's it. And, and it's a trade very interesting. What is the paid off of the trade? The trade, the paid off of the trade is the also the, the difference between the strikes. So this trade, if this trade costs you 10 bucks, it will pay you 10 bucks. If it costs you 20 bucks, it will pay you 20 bucks. And you want to start to wonder why will anyone buy enter a trade that will not deliver any profits. <laughs> no, why would you do that? I mean, you are limited by the cost of the trade. However, you will notice that the parameter D is, uh, is, uh, is slightly less than one in this case. So the box will be slightly discounted uh, from the difference of the of the strikes, but I, I guess is this will be negative here. This number will be usually negative. So um, the box is one of these interesting trades where so most of the time the box is overpriced and you're paying more for the box than the fair price. And the question is why the boxes are all priced like that. I mean, if the difference between the strikes is, is 10 points and you check the box, the box is like 10.20. It's always more than, so the question is who will pay 10.20 today to get paid 
10 in a month or two months? And that's an interesting question, no? So let's look at the application of the boxes. As I mentioned, notice that the cost of the box is heavily dependent on the strikes that never change. The, the strikes are the strikes, the, the, they are set during the whole duration of the trade, but it depends on the discount factor. Right here, no? the cost of the, the fair cost depends on the discount factor. And the discount factor depends on the interest rates. Like in this case, for instance, I remove dividends, I only let interest rates. Notice the discount factor is just the exponential of the negative interest rates times the time to expiration. So D could potentially change during the, the discount factor, could potentially change during the life of the trade. And a box trade is therefore a good way to speculate on interest rates. So it's very interesting. A box trade can be seen as a play on interest rates. It's a, it's a very interesting way of playing interest rates. And it's done with options. Amazingly, uh, the options are connected to interest rates, but the, the connection is not that evident, but a box trade kind of brings that connection into the light. It really shows you how heavily depending on the interest rate is the price of the box. And, and but other than this, other than speculating with the deduction of the trade, the real, uh, the way the boxes are used in real life, are boxes are actually used as financial instruments, uh, as lending. Um, Doing a box trade is basically a good way to borrow money. If you are in need of huge amount of mo huge amounts of money that you want to borrow at a very competitive rate, then a box trade is for you. Although this is this is kind of rhetorical. It's not really for us. It's not for retail traders. But um, th th this is a this is a lending and borrowing vehicle available to really huge players. Uh, just I'll let you think about it a little bit why you can borrow money with a box but I'm going to show you that it does happen this is like real life data in this slide I'm showing data for today for SPX this is open interest data for the December 2017 expiration no uh, this is this this is just a chart of open interest that shows you uh, all the strikes and every bar each bar represents open interest for puts are red and calls are blue and this will look very very normal I guess a bunch of puts at lower strikes 1950 this is kind of the normal distribution of, of open interest however if you really pay close attention you will notice a very weird configuration notice this blue line here and this blue line here like who in heavens is buying calls uh, it's not clear from the chart, but who is buying calls for the 1,000 strike? Uh, SPX is 2,530 something right now. Why will anyone buy calls or trade calls at 1,000 strike? And notice here too that they are traded at 2,000 strike. And they are very similar in sizes. They are almost 30,000 and 35,000 contracts. Traded. And you can see also that puts are, are, are heavy here. No. So this is a box trade. That, and you can see the box trade happening right here on SPX options. And, and in fact, SPX options have the favorite vehicle for box trades. And also the 1,000 and 2,000 strikes are very favored because what is the difference between the strikes? The difference is 1,000. And if you remember the cost of the of the box is proportional to the difference of the strike. So this is a very expensive box. Very, very expensive because it's 1,000. One contract represents 100,000 bucks. No? That's one little contract. And we have 35,000 of them. So this is like a serious amount of dough we are talking here. We are talking about a serious amount of money. Uh, being used in this box, no, like really serious amount of dollars. And how is a is a transaction? Well, in a box trade, whoever is buying the box is actually the lender. No, so let's say I have a few billion dollars sitting around, no, they, they, nothing else to do with those billions of bucks, <laughs> and I just um, 
and and I just buy buy a box. So because I pay for the box, I transfer money. I gave my money to the other person. The seller of the box uh, is the is is giving it to me at a discount from the price. Why is the seller giving me to a discount? Because he is the borrower. The seller is the borrower. So he is he's receiving money. He's he's selling this thing cheap because at the end of the period when the options expire, he has to pay me full. And the difference between the selling price and the full price is the interest that I, I earn during that period. That's how it works. So that's how the, the box works. The, the box is uh, the seller is discounting the box from from um, like the payment as you saw on the on the equation. D is usually less than one, so so the box is less than the difference, but it pays the difference. So that's how mono, money gets borrowed uh, on the big leagues. And so instead of going to a bank and borrow two billion bucks, I come here and do this box. How this works? I mean. How how is it possible that they borrow money? Of course, this is if you try to do it, <laughs> you cannot do it. If you're a retail trader, it's very likely that your account is what is called regulation T. So if you have a regulation T margin account, then there is nothing, there is no benefit with this trade because you cannot use the money. If you are the seller of the box, you could you cannot use that cash. That cash is completely locked in your margin account and it cannot be used. So for a retail trader, guys, sorry to burst your bubble, forget about it. This is not a cheap way to borrow money from strangers. <laughs> if you have a regular uh, regulation team margin. There might be other type of accounts where this trade might or might not work. Uh, this particular trade is geared towards parties, towards traders that can post collateral, very liquid, highly uh, high quality assets, uh, like treasuries, and, and 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 they work directly with the clearing house. They don't work with the brokers or anything. When they do these trades, they are doing these trades directly with the clearing house, uh, or well, with, with with the broker. But the broker deals with the clearing house and and, and shows that you have the collateral. Uh, this is done because sometimes banks and institutions own billions of dollars on treasuries and they don't want to sell them. They say you, you need the cash, but you don't want to sell the treasuries. Then you borrow against them and that's it. And that's how this works. You borrow against those treasuries you're holding <laughs> and uh, and you use the cash for whatever thing and then you repay it. No, it is it is uh, very simple and uh, it's a very active market. And as you can see, you are curious. You can compute the notional value of this loan, and you will see that it's mind blowing. You know, the notional value of this loan is thirty-five thousand boxes with one thousand uh, strike is exactly thirty-five million, and times hundred is three point five billion dollars. So right here is a three point five billion dollar trade. And it happens, and and that's one of the examples of how liquid is the SPX option market for you. And I think this is the last, yes, this is the last slide, and and this was the discussion about advanced topics. So to just um, summarize here, we talk about put call parity, we talk about the effects on the spreads, we talk about. Um, just using put call parity to compute prices for in the money options, using put call parity to design synth synthetic trades, and finally using synthetic trades to create all these very interesting trades, which are conversions, reversals, and boxes. Of course, this is really kind of high level and abstract. I didn't have a graph or many examples of how to do it because I, I don't want you to trade this yet. I really want you to introduce to these concepts boxes. Forget it. Like there is no way to trade a box. There, there might be ways to to play a hard to war with boxes too, but nah, better not to do it. Is 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 better to just. Um, uh, stick with a normal trade first but if you are an institution or if you go to work an institution then you will see this box trade um, very frequently again thank you folks for listening to this long presentation that i just split in two parts and i apologize for the sudden split uh, th that was my very poor man way of editing the video uh, it was too long but i hope you enjoy it 
thank you again and let's see if I can continue these uh, advanced tutorials and some point later on. Take care.